Hello. Um, I'm going to talk about something that we call at Intel Software Defined Everything. And I know this is an embedded conference, and oh. software defined networking, software defined compute is historically a data center thing. And because this is an embedded conference, I want to at least touch a few things on this. Um, it, software defined compute, we all know what it is. It's about virtualization, containers, isolation, performance, those kind of things. It's about slicing a system into something that is dynamic, that you can run by the second, that you can spin up, spin down. Software defined networking, well, it avoids having to run a wire somewhere. Right? You, have, you want to change your world, you want to change an application, you don't have to go, call the network guy to run a wire from building A to building B. Software defined storage, same concept. You, you, you turn something physical into something more fungible. And this has driven the data center, this has driven the cloud, and as Jim talked earlier about cloud native computing, it, all, it enabled a whole new world on top of this sort of software defined infrastructure. Um, you have dynamic capacity, you have flexibility, and that allowed a new class of applications. Um, you have machine learning all at scale. You have Hadoop, you have Spark, you have many of these applications that are no longer a small little thing in a box, but they're actually based on scaling infrastructure, scaling up, scaling down. Um, this was cloud, and if you, this is almost a slide I could have put on the, on, the, on the screen two years ago, five years ago, and this was cloud. Now, software defined everything is basically admitting that the software defined data architecture, data center architecture, is becoming the architecture of everything. It's a dominant design pattern that really is gonna dominate every single industry where software is running today. We know the cloud, um, but it's also taking over IoT. Your Nest thermostat is just an example of software-defined everything. Half the application of your thermostat is running in the cloud. Um, half of your light bulbs, if you don't think about it, half of what's making your light bulb smart is actually not in your house, it's somewhere else. And that's something that everybody keeps talking about edge. What is edge? Well, edge is a cloud distributed or it is your home to the cloud. Um, all of these industries and is, are taking over the pattern of software-defined everything. Industrial is an example of the next generation of evolution, and I was in China a few weeks ago where they really, where manufacturing is fundamentally changing. Rather than building a factory for building one specific product, really they, they make a more generic factory that they, with software, can define at the time of production, what they want to do. Rather than retooling for four weeks to change products, they can retool in minutes to, a new, to building a new, new device after that. Um, the hardest part that we haven't conquered yet is automotive. And Jim talked about automotive Linux earlier, um, but a car is hard. If you buy a car today, and you, 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 or you see one outside here, a typical modern car has about 100 microcontrollers. Someone can control your brakes, your, your tire pressure, as a hundred, what about a hundred little uh, CPUs doing things? Um, these CPUs run about eight operating systems. Um, there's about a hundred million lines of car in a, code in a car, from the dashboard to your brakes to the Android for the kids in the back. It's all complicated. And complicated systems that are fixed and rigid are sort of the, the past. So, the car is becoming a data center, and when you go to a self-driving car, it's even more obvious. You have a stunning amount of machine learning, you have a stunning amount of map data, that all makes that car a data center. So, what makes cars hard? What makes cars hard is safety. Um, if you rent your Amazon machine, and once in a while, you have a little stutter for 10 milliseconds, 100 milliseconds, and it's back to business, you don't notice. If your braking system has a 100 millisecond delay, you kind of notice. Um, so a car is a little, has, a, has a set of uh, constraints that are a little harder than the data center and functionally safe, and, and Jim mentioned it earlier, functional safety is actually the next barrier for software-defined everything. How do you do software-defined everything in a world where functionally safe matters? And again, safety is about not dying when, you're, when you push a brake pedal. Um, at Intel, we look at this in a, sort of an architecture where you have 
a system where parts of the system is functional safe, but parts of the system run more generic applications and they have to interact together in a way that is still safe, but you have flexibility for the application. And I'll, I'll, there's a bunch of logos on this slide, and I'll cover some of them a little bit later. Um, in this software-defined world, one thing we've, we're, we're really realizing is the old paradigm of, hey, we add a feature over here, we add a feature over there, it's kind of breaking down. And that if you have very complex technologies that, 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 that touch many pieces of the software stack, you really have to build the whole stack and test it and optimize it to make sure that you don't miss a little piece here or that it all works together well. At Intel, we care about performance. We add features to our CPUs. When we add a new instruction, like let's say AVX 512, it turns out that the, the pieces of software you have to touch to make this work all the way to the end user is a stunning amount. Yeah, sure, we have a kernel patch, which is 10 lines, that's easy. You have a compiler change, you have a GDFC change. It turns out you have to hit touch KVM, you have to touch Kubernetes, you have to touch um, your whole OpenStack, whatever orchestration layer you put or, or below or above it. You have to touch all the frameworks in the middle, the math libraries, all the way to the machine learning frameworks and even above that, just for one little feature. And the only chance you have to get that to work is to actually build what we end up calling a reference stack, build it, open source the stack, even though it's just mostly configuration. Build it, show it, um, measure the performance, analyze it, and actually allow it and the user to verify and see what it, what it is doing. Um, machine learning is the, the sort of the obvious candidate there, but we're looking at database as a service, we're looking at all kinds of edge use cases where this sort of vertical stack integration is actually needed, and actually it's hard. And good, I like hard problems like Jim said, so that's okay. Um, at the basis of these stacks is an operating system. A kernel, Linux OS, um, plugging my hobby project or my, my, my sort of passion project. The clear Linux project is a, is a distribution we make at Intel for, for the last four or five years where we really want to sort of change a little bit how operating systems are built, but also have a place where we can actually innovate make sure all the pieces work together very well um, in order to sort of be the foundation of those vertical use cases. If you look at any use case in the cloud, Linux is at the bottom. And earlier, Jim talked about Linux is everywhere. Yeah, it is. So it starts with a Linux layer. Um, it's opt Linux is for obviously optimized for the hardware. Um, functional safety is important because it starts at the bottom. You need to have that layer where the foundation is, can be functionally safe. And that's, as much as people here in the room like to write software, functionally safe is a lot about process and paperwork. So there's a lot of that on there. Um, you need to be able to update, you need to be able to write the modern software with using CI, CD, it's, all of those kind of things are part of how you build an operating system. Um, on top of that, you have the, what, we, what you can call the isolation layer. And I, some people like VM, some people like containers, some people like a little bit of both. Um, but for a lot of the isolation layers, people use virtual machines, especially in a world where you need to be functionally safe. And the Linux Foundation project called Acorn is a, is a very lightweight hypervisor, but is really trying to be simple and small so that you can actually make safety claims about it. Some of that is about paperwork, but some of that is about showing that no, there aren't memory allocations that can fail and then that your brakes don't work. Right? You want to make sure that everything is configured up front. You know that nothing is going to fail randomly on you so that if you hit the brake pedal, you actually slow down the car. That is actually hard. And a simple hypervisor underneath allows you to partition a, a physical system in a part where you can make these kind of assumptions and claims and a part where you don't need to do that, where you can run more fancy software. Um, and some of it is you also have to figure out how do you do graphics? Because it turns out by regulation, your speedometer in your car is actually a safety critical thing. If your speedometer doesn't work anymore, you're, you're not allowed to drive your car. And sure, so you have to have graphics that actually show the speedometer and guarantee that it is, is there. So graphics have to be shared, you have to have real time, it can't be big, and small footprint is not an optimization statement. Small footprint is really a statement about can we do enough paperwork and analysis to prove that my brakes will work? And if you have a million lines of code, you're not gonna get there. 
if you have 20, 30,000 lines of code, you have maybe a chance to be able to show that this code path cannot fail because there, isn't, there aren't constructs in the code that can fail. So this is ACON. Um, the second layer of our, is about the, the trade-off between speed and security. And Jim talked about containers versus virtual machines a little bit. It's historically, people consider virtual machines secure. Containers, they're fast. Um, they're sort of secure, depending on your security pattern, your threat model. Um, can we do security and speed? Um, I've talked many times before about a project we call Clear Containers that shows that a, you can use a hypervisor as a backbone of your container infrastructure, so that you use container infrastructure for deploying the software, but you can use the security of a virtual machine as to, for the isolation part. Um, we've partnered with Hyper to run through, through a project called Kata Containers, which is really about um, making, building an industry base between a, a series of partner companies that are and, and community uh, contributors, so that we have one uh, container infrastructure based on virtualization. Um, and the end result is you have something light f because it's containers, but at the same time it's, it's secure because the isolation is, is done using the virtualization hardware of your system. Okay, so that's half of it. Um, we've been, if you look at a traditional hypervisor setup, you have KVM in the kernel, you have QMU on top, and then you run your, your guest OS in the, in the VM. It turns out that QMU is kind of big. QMU does many, many, many things, including emulating a floppy drive, including a floppy drive controller, and emulating a cable that, between the floppy drive controller and the floppy. And all of those kind of things you don't need in a cloud setup, and from a security perspective, you don't want. If you have, and we looked at it, Typical uh, hypervisor setup has about two, three hundred um, device emulation models running at any point in time. Any of those device emulation models is a place that is code that runs on the hypervisor side that the guest can talk to, which by definition becomes the security exposure. We started looking at, okay, do we need that? We don't need a floppy controller anymore because if I hire a new employee today, they don't even know what a floppy looks like. So we started saying, okay, how much can we remove from a emulation hypervisor layer to still run all Linux and maybe some Windows without, without losing any of them? And it's a project called Nemo, and we sort of managed to reduce the code footprint of an active QMU by 10 times. Instead of 2 million lines of code, you have about 200,000 lines of code running at it in reality. It saves memory, it saves startup time, and it reduces your security exposure. Okay, so we talked, I talked earlier about exposing hardware features. You have to do the OS, you have to do the kernel, you have to do um, the hypervisor, and you have to do the runtimes, all these kinds of things. If you, do that, if you do that right, across all these pieces of the stack, you can actually get very, very significant uh, performance increases. We've, we've noticed that if you take an out-of-the-box sort of an optimized stack, and you spend a week or two fixing the right operating system, making sure all the pieces are there, you can get sometimes an eight times, 10 times performance, 15 times performance increase, just by changing a few software things. So getting it wrong versus getting it right is a very, very significant amount of performance, and performance is cost, performance is power, it's all the same kind of thing. Um, so we're treat as a, as a, as from an Intel perspective, we're trying really hard to make sure all of this just works for you. Um, that, and that means that we have to optimize not just the kernel, not just the hypervisor, but also the layer on both of it. Um, the Eigen libraries, if you want to do TensorFlow, the, the Hadoop layer, if you want to do big data, um, TensorFlow itself, of course, ZLab, there's a lot of um, libraries that we're now really working on making sure all the little pieces of optimizations are there and in a, done in a way that you can actually consume and use. Um, and the last thing is I need to plug our, our booth. If you want to see anything I talked about today, we have a lot, series of demos in our booth in the show floor, a few floors down. Um, so if you want to talk to us, I'll, I'll be there all day. Several of our, our, our other engineers are gonna be there. Okay. And with that, thank you for listening and back to Jim. 
Thank you, Arian.